Fasten your seat belts. <clears throat> Put the tray in the upright and locked position. So, a glow. Welcome to the first day of a brand new era. It's my responsibility today to keep the mood of awe and celebration, but at the same time to sober us up. We can't take this conference any higher than last night, because that would make it a rah-rah thing and it's not what the Lord wants. My job is to broaden and deepen the power of what God released last night to include all of us and all those thousands and hundreds of thousands and millions of people who didn't have the privilege of being here with us. The difference between the fulfillment of a promise and only having a partial release is literally the quality of your attitude and approach to the word that God has spoken. I believe these days the Holy Spirit is closing the gap between promise and fulfillment. What we thought would take years would take months. What we thought would take months would take weeks. What we thought would take weeks will take days. What we thought would take days will take hours until we come to a day when prophecy is spoken in the morning and fulfilled in the afternoon of the very same day. We are behind the time of the kingdom and we're playing catch up. So God is speeding up our development and there is a quickening spirit abroad in the earth and God is wandering to and fro, looking for a people on, on whose behalf he can show himself strong. And I believe Aglow is one of those first companies that he set his eyes on and his heart on. That's why we've had this week that we've had. You know, prophets train all their life for moments like this to do something that you know is not going to change a generation, but it's going to create a whole new era, but is actually going to be the type of situation where the kingdom comes down and begins pressing into us. There was a point in Jesus' ministry when he said, you have all the law and the prophets until now. And what he's saying is, we don't have that anymore in the same way. He said, now the kingdom is here and everyone is pressing into it. And I do believe with all my heart that a glow is a kingdom community. It's a kingdom organization. It's a kingdom company. And our role in the earth, much like Jesus in the gospels, is to exemplify the nature and the power and the substance and the promise of the kingdom of heaven. Thankfully, we are heading into the mother of all fights. You don't seem too excited about that. And we need the word of the Lord in a way we've never needed it before. And we need to use the word of the Lord in the ways that we have never used it before. We need to pay attention. We need to wake up. We need to understand who we are. We need to understand what God is saying, what he's thinking, what he's planning, what he's wanting to do, and the urgency in his own heart to do it. That's the nicest way I can find of saying that God is impatient. There is an urgency in his heart to release things. We're in those days, we're in those times. 
And we have to stop messing around with prophecy. One of the things I adore about Jane is that every single event we do, she's always referencing the prophetic words that God has spoken. And in her heart, it's like, it's a, it's a, like an unspoken plea. Can we please all come to attention and pay attention to what the Lord has said and stop asking him to say something more when we haven't paid attention to what he's already spoken. I had some leaders phone me up and say, we want you to come on January the 1st. We're having a big blowout meeting and we want to, you to give us the word of the Lord for this year. I said, what was the word of the Lord for last year? And he told me, I said, did you do it? And there was this silence. I said, well, just repeat that one because I'm not coming. <laughs> it will be a waste of time to come to a people who only think that prophecy is some weird spiritual form of trending. Say that in the nicest possible way. <laughs> Here's the thing, when prophecy is released, it begins a process that we need to partner with in the Holy Spirit to enable our own development to take place. Prophecy must become as true in our heart as it is in his. And we treat prophecy only as a, an event that needs to happen. Something that God will do someday, one day, somehow. We don't realize that our response is key to all of this. That you have to find yourself in that prophetic word. If there's a gap between where you are right now and how the, world, how the word is describing you, guess who needs to change? Prophecy is only fulfilled. It, it's not time that brings fulfillment to prophecy. It's positioning. And when your life and your approach to God, your intentionality and your character rises up to meet the prophetic word on that level, when your attitude gets to that level, something will happen. I'm here to say we can do that sooner than we imagine. As soon as you're ready, it'll come. So don't delay it. Don't delay your response. Don't delay your responsibility towards the spirit of prophecy to begin to partner with the Holy Spirit and begin to ask questions in your lighthouses, in your areas, in your regions. What must we do? What must we do to come up to the level where this prophecy can be fulfilled? Your next question is, how fast can we do it? Because we're in those times. We're in those days. Prophecy is designed to create a life that can attract prophetic fulfillment. When God speaks the word to you and he calls you up into something, he's looking at you saying, I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready right now. I'm ready as fast as you are. God doesn't measure time. He measures growth. Beloved, some of us have kept him waiting too long. Prophecy is much more than an event. It's an invitation to become. And the reshaping of your identity and destiny is critical to the fulfillment of that work. The Holy Spirit is looking for focused intentionality. He seeks to develop our persona into the character that can attract prophetic release. In recent years, we've been upgrading our relationship with God based on his promises based on prophecy. Jane has been excellent in keeping it in the forefront of our attention and refocusing the movement 
on learning to become present future. We're not present past anymore. There's nothing back there for us. And it's time for us to bring our prophetic words from the background into the foreground and understand that the antidote to your past is not your present being sorted out, it's your future being determined. And we become a prophetic people in every sense of the word, living present to future. So that there are days when we're going to be saying, this is that which was spoken. And we're living in the unfolding of prophetic words because there's no more powerful lifestyle than that. To know that what you're doing today was foretold years ago. I'm living in the unfolding of prophecy. Teresa and I, we talk about that. We're living in the unfolding of prophecies in our own life. Everything we do is predicated around the prophetic words that we have. I love the fact that God is always previous. So we're meeting situations right now that he spoke about five or ten years ago. So we bring those prophetic words from the background into the foreground and pay attention because the time of fulfillment is right now. Listen, guys, there are still too many of our regions and our areas are intent on business as usual, present past focus, problem oriented. For goodness sake, we are delivered from that attitude, that mindset. It's time some of us caught up. We are a pioneering organization. We're not a bunch of settlers. We're an exploring, pioneering organization. And we have territory to take. And there's territory in your area, in your region, around your lighthouse that you need to take. And you've got prophetic words that give you permission. It's time for our intentionality to match the Lord's. The spoken and the written words of God need to become the catalyst for personal and corporate transformation in this movement. There is a window of opportunity here in the prophetic, and it's designed to open us up to the ongoing experience of favor as a lifestyle. It's prophecy that gives us much needed confidence regarding the outcome and the certainty of victory and fulfillment. If you have prophetic words that say you're going to be somebody, then it doesn't matter what's in front of you, you've got a prophetic word that can overcome it. When David faced Goliath, he knew that he couldn't die because he had a prophecy from Big Sam saying you're going to be king in Israel one day. Well, he, he looked at Goliath and said, dude, I've got a word about being king, but I'm not king right now, so it sucks to be you. Because I'm the only one that's not dying here. I've got a word from the Lord. That's when you realize that prophecy is the best health insurance ever. I want to read you a scripture that's really important for us, I believe, to talk about and to think about. And it's in 2 Kings chapter 13. It's a story, actually. Verse 14 to 19. It says, When Elisha became sick with the illness of which he was to die, Joash, the king of Israel, came down to him and wept over him and said, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. And Elijah said to him, take a bow and arrow. So he took a bow and arrows. And then he said to the king of Israel, put your hand on the bow, and he put his hand on it. And Elisha laid his hands on the king's hands. And he said, open the window towards the east, and he opened it. And Elisha said, shoot, and he shot. 
And he said, the Lord's arrow of victory, even the arrow of victory over Aram, for you will defeat the Arameans at Aphek until you have destroyed them. And then he said, take the arrows, and he took them, and he said to the king of Israel, strike the ground, and he struck it three times and stopped. So the man of God was angry with him and said, you should have struck five or six times. Then you would have struck Aram until you would have destroyed it. But now you shall strike Aram only three times. There's two parts to this story. The first part is pretty negative. It's about the danger of only going halfway. But the second part is the real story about this situation. And that is what God fully intended. The first part is a story of regret. You know, the worst words you can ever hear from God, apart from, depart from me, I never knew you. The worst words, I think, in the prophetic you can ever hear from the Lord is, you should have, then you would have. But now you will only have this. The key to this word is that the bow is your prophetic promise, your permission. And you need to be able to draw that bow back as far as possible to its fullest extent because an arrow will go far if, it has that, if the bow has a certain tensile strength and power. And the more you can draw on the bow, the further the arrow can fly. And it's the same with prophecy. The more you draw on the prophetic word, the more you study it, meditate it, line up your life in line with it, create alignment the more power and fulfillment that prophecy can release to us. And prophecy and promise, they create a window of opportunity. Prophecy is the word of God proceeding now. And it therefore puts us on high alert. It propels us into a relationship with Jesus as the living word. All words, whether written, whether they're scripture, whether they're prophetic, spoken, they all point to Jesus, who he is and what he wants to do. He is the word made flesh in us. When we receive that word, it becomes part of us and it forms our identity and a new nature. And we must proclaim that new part of our nature in Christ that's being established we have to get into character with the word. David became kingly before he was crowned king. Prepare the way of the Lord. If you get a prophetic word that you're a warrior and currently you're a wimp, you've got some growing up to do. You can't be standing around, sitting around in your wimpdom praying for the day when you will become a warrior, you need to be start coming a warrior the moment that prophecy is given you. You need to start changing the way you see yourself, changing the way you think about yourself, changing the way you talk about yourself. Get rid of that awful negativity. Jesus is wonderful, but I'm rubbish. Biggest load of nonsense ever. If Christ is in you, you can't be rubbish. That's an insult. We have to grow up to the measure of the fullness of his stature. The arrow is about strategic victories in the territory that God is giving you for the future. Your window of opportunity is always open to Jesus first. When you look through that window, you need to see him waving and smiling, saying, come on. Because I do believe the Lord is saying to us today, come. I believe the day of wait 
is over because we're behind the time of the kingdom and where it needs to be in the earth. He's saying come. He's saying now. He's saying today. He's saying this is the day. Don't harden your heart. Stop looking at yourself. Look at me first. We have to become like him so we can inherit inhabit the territory that he's giving us. And your prophecy, your promise is the vital part of your engagement with the spirit of proclamation. To walk up and down your neighborhood and say, this is my territory in Jesus' name. To strike the ground with your arrows of promise. I often read my prophetic words out in my meditation room. And I'll read them out loud. Then I'll stand there and I'll say, Lord, you said, 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 until something takes hold of me. And then I'm standing and I'm praying in alignment with the heart and the passion of God for me. What needs to change next? What do I need to pay attention to next? What are you developing in me next? Because I want to partner with the word. I don't want to be sat around drinking coffee, waiting for God to do something when he's already done it. He's given me a prophetic word. He's declared his intent. And now I have to match my intentionality to his. That's why I keep files on all my friends. Because I know all their prophetic words. I know their identity statements. I read through their prophetic words because they're my friends. And when I feel there's a part of a word here that's about to come to pass, I'll call up and say, let's go for a coffee. And I want to talk about it. I think this is becoming a now word. When it was spoken, it was a future word. But every future word has to become a now word at some point. And when I'm looking, I'm saying, I think this is a now word. What do you think? I think you could be right. So what are your intentions towards it? What needs to change? What adjustments need to be made? What must change in your thinking? How does your lens take on a whole different viewpoint? What language needs to come out of your mouth in prayer, in declaration, in confession, in proclamation? How are you going to walk now that you've got this word that's crying out for release right now? It's what good friends do, right, for one another. That's why, that's why Jane is always referencing the prophetic words that have been spoken. What will it take to destroy the negatives and the weakness in your life? I think a prophetic word is a big part of that. The word of the Lord creates chaos against negativity. It releases your weakness to go somewhere else. You turn prophecy and promise onto your low places to build them up in terms of who God is. You turn prophetic words on your lighthouse, on the low places in your area, in your region, in your finances, in whatever. You turn prophetic, the prophetic word, on the low places first to see them get built up so you are established at a different level. Prophecy is designed to give you elevation. It's important for us in a globe to make war on passivity, to make war on procrastination and negativity, to overwhelm fear and unbelief and victim thinking, overwhelm it with the favor of the Lord. I like telling the Lord all the things he's good at in my life. That's worship, I think. Lord, these are all the things that you're good at in my life and in my heart. These are all the things you've proven to me. Now show me something else that you want to be good at. Show me another area 
where you want to prove yourself to me and where I can prove myself to you. It's important that we get above pressure and stress and all that learned helplessness that the world teaches us to get above those, to let prophecy elevate you. So that we're not overwhelmed by the pressure. We're overwhelmed by the process of what God wants to be for us. I like crying. I'm a crier. And there are times when I'm reading out my prophetic words. And there are times when I'm reading out my journals of, to the Lord. I read my journals out to him. The things that he's done in my life. And he makes me cry just out of gratitude. Do you remember this, Lord? Sometimes he'll say, talk to me about 1994. And in my heart, I go back to that place. I figured, oh yeah, I remember 94. That was the time I was bent over for three months because the weight of your presence on me was so great, I couldn't stand up. And he said, yeah, that was funny, eh? <laughs> I put something into your heart that time, Graham, and it's still there. He knows what he's doing. It was a little weird being bent over for three months. But I was okay as long as I could hear him laughing every day. Because he thought it was funny, God bless him. <laughs> He's not ordinary, so you can't be either. He does things differently. Get over yourself. But we're learning how to live by the permissions of God. And we're learning to be fully persuaded about who God is for us. This first part of the story is a story of regret. All promises and prophecy contain keys that provoke a new lens, new thinking new language, and we need to use them because those three things, lens, mindset, language, are the building blocks of identity. God shows you who you are. Then you have to think about who you are the way that he's thinking about it, and then you have to talk to yourself the way that he talks to you, and you learn a new language of faith and favor. It's important to think about yourself in him and to practice that focused approach to who you are in your identity, to change how you talk about yourself. Because those words that you have, they're designed to shape your identity, to teach you obedience to your own promises, to step into a place of trust and faith in terms of who he is in you and who you are in him. And then you can take charge of your surroundings, which really to me is what a glow is all about. We go into times of chaos and we take charge. We go into situations where the enemy is working, like ground zero, and we take charge in that moment. We go into pressurized circumstances because we're the ones not under pressure. How on earth can you be under pressure when the Prince of Peace lives in you? How on earth can you be stressed when the King of Rest is living on the inside of you? We're the ones that go into places of pressure because we don't have any. So we bring our peace to those places. We bring our rest, we bring order. And what we speak out and what we demonstrate and what we act out is key to the development of the kingdom on this planet. You know that. All I'm saying is it's time for us to upgrade all of that and go to another completely different level. 
because of our own promises. Take what God has put in your hand and fight using it. By these words spoken over you, fight a good fight. That was my baptismal verse, 1 Timothy 1.18. By these words previously spoken over you, fight a good fight. The irony is that the guy who was baptizing me didn't believe in the Holy Spirit or prophecy. But he gave me that verse. I can still hear God chuckling over that one. He knows who he is. And he knows who you are. Favor means that God is absolutely biased towards you. It's time for us to trade on that bias and stop standing in difficult circumstances wondering if God will do anything. And trade on the favor, trade on the bias that God has towards you because all of heaven is attracted to Jesus in you. Trade on that. When prophecy comes in power, a window of opportunity is opened over your life. Beloved, your intention to receive must match God's intention to give. He's not reluctant to bless us. He's wholehearted towards us and he is unchanging. Take responsibility for your blessing. Nobody else can do that for you. It's your job. Take responsibility for where you live, for the lighthouse you're in. The king was half-hearted in response. He didn't understand the prophetic significance of the time he was in. And the promise, the, 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 the majestic promise, what God is offering him <clears throat> was, this is the Lord's arrow of victory. You can defeat the Arameans until you have destroyed them. Total and complete and utter deliverance. God's intention is not just a victory, but a complete destruction of what is against us. It's important in the prophetic that you attack what is against you so strongly that it never comes back at you. That's who we are as a globe. Permission to get yourself into a place of overcoming where the enemy cannot affect you again in that place and take that victory around the nations. Go to key cities and release something. Here's the other side of that truth. Opposition attaches to what you don't remove. If you don't act in alignment with who God is for you, if you don't attach yourself to the prophetic word and say, this is mine, this is who I am, this is how I can operate, this is my territory, this is my ground of overcoming. If you're not attaching yourself to the word of the Lord, then the enemy will come and attach himself to you. Opposition attaches to what you don't remove. Blessings attach themselves to what you respond to in obedience. Aren't they awful words? You should have, then you would have, but now you will only have this. You could have overcome the enemy, but now the enemy is going to come back at you. I wonder how the king felt on the morning of the fourth battle. For the rest of his life, he would live with regret. Guys, let me say this to you. Don't come crying to God later. Five years from now, what would you wish you had done? When you get a prophetic word, 
you get a huge yes in heaven over your life. Please don't turn it into a no. Don't turn it into a maybe. Here's the principle here. When the opportunity of a lifetime comes, you must make sure you act within the lifetime of the opportunity. Okay, enough about that. The other side of the story is different. This is not just about the account of a leader who blew a major opportunity with God. This is the account of the nature of prophetic opportunity itself. Prophecy tells you what is yours. And it's important that you possess your possessions in the prophetic realm. Prophecy tells you what God is releasing to you. It empowers you to begin the process of change required to enable fulfillment. And every time you are responding to the prophetic word, something is growing in you in terms of trust and faith. The whole dynamic inside yourself is being transformed away from weakness, away from doubt or fear or unbelief, into a place of confidence, into a new reality, into a place of trust and faith and favor. And you start to walk in a certainty. And you stand with purpose in situations. And you are the one person that makes a difference. For years, I've known that I can go into any situation and make it bow to the faith and favor that's in me. I know that me walking into a room makes a difference to the people in that room. It's not big-headed to say that. It's just a fact. It's your identity that needs to show up. And you know who you are, and you know what you're capable of in Jesus. And you know what he's capable of in you. And you trade on that. There are times when I say to the Lord, what do you want to do? And he says, what do you want to do? I say, well, I would like to do this. He says, okay, we'll do that. What's that? That's a partnership where he's trusting Jesus in you. And there are other times when you trust Jesus for you and through you. I like that. I like that God says, hey, your turn. How about you show up? And I'll be the support act. I'll get behind you. Why? Because he loves development. He doesn't want to be, have to be telling us everything. He wants us to be saying, Lord, I'm, I'm thinking this. What are you thinking? That sounds like a good idea to me. Let's do that. The plan of God needs to unfold. And it can only do so by agreement and alignment. Jane and I were talking on the phone a few months back and she said, uh, <clears throat> what are you thinking about? What are you reading right now? What are you thinking about? I said, oh, I'm thinking about alignment. I said, I'm thinking about the focus of alignment and I'm also thinking about the focus I have if I'm not allowed. Thinking about the power of non-alignment and what it sets up against me. And there was this silence on the other end of the phone. <coughs> and she went, hmm. <laughs> and that was it. That was it. We went on to talk about something else. But that's what I was thinking about. Because I think you can't think about alignment and what it does without also thinking about non-alignment and what that does, what that creates. Alignment and non-alignment, they both create something. But you have to know what happens if you don't respond 
or if you don't obey. You have to be aware of that. Because when you are aware of it, you make sure everything in your heart is turned to alignment. Prophecy, I believe, creates an Ephesians 3.20 moment <clears throat> that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we can ask or even think according to the power that works within us. And the power within us is Christ and the Holy Spirit. Turn your prophecy over to them and act in agreement and alignment with how they want to do it. Prophecy tells us what we can do, what we have permission for. So in Exodus 7, 1, it's one of my favorite examples, is where in Exodus uh, 6, 30, Moses is saying to the Lord, behold, and the word behold there means see me as I am. Look at me. Do I look like someone who can talk to Pharaoh? Seriously? Behold, see me as I am. I can't talk to Pharaoh. And the Lord said to him, see, I have made you as God to Pharaoh. And Aaron's going to be your prophet. What do you think about that? He's Moses saying, see me as I am. And the Lord says, no, you see yourself as I am. See, I make you as God to Pharaoh. He's not inviting Moses to be the fourth member of the Trinity. What he's saying is, in this situation, you have power to become this. Because God knew that Moses thought, that he, God knew that Pharaoh thought that he was a deity in human form. So he's going to have to have some kind of an excuse why he just got his butt kicked by a shepherd from the wilderness. And the only reason he can come up with is, well, that Moses, he must have been God in human form. And the Lord, I can imagine the Lord grinning at Moses saying, let's do that. That sounds like fun. Let's do that. That word dictated the terms of Moses' relationship and partnership with God in that situation. And it caused his lens to change, his mindset to shift, and a new language to emerge in him. And we saw that in Pharaoh's court, the way he conducted himself. We saw it by the Red Sea when he put his rod out and the sea began to pile up on itself. We saw it in the wilderness when he struck a rock and water came out. Breakfast flying in every morning. All kinds of things happening. Why? Because here's a new Moses who's acting in line with God's permission. Joshua and Caleb believed the prophecy through Moses about the promised land. They believed they would get, <clears throat> that Israel would be delivered from Egypt, that they would come to a new land of promise, that God would give that land to them that they would have houses they didn't build, vineyards they didn't plant, wells they didn't dig, a turnkey operation, that they would receive the wealth of the wicked as they left Egypt. People were giving them livestock and money and gold and silver. The whole economy of a nation was given to them before they even got to where they were going. And Joshua and Caleb they were steeped in those words. So when those guys saw the giants, they saw an opportunity. They realized the giant is designed to show me how big I'm going to be when I take them down. That's the size I'm going to be when I take those suckers down. They will be our prey. Their response to the giants was, they're going to be our prey. 
we will surely overcome. Their protection is removed. God is with us. Do not rebel. And they base that response not on what they saw in the land, but on the prophetic word that came through Moses. They were concerned that people would rebel against their own promise. You know, a person who has no faith in their own prophecy, their own promise, or their own permission is going to be is a grasshopper in the making. Prophecy is your currency. It's your resource. It's your provision. God does not resource your ministry. He resources your identity in Jesus. That's why we always, in the new covenant, we always tie our prophecies to the new man in Christ. That's why we've been doing game changers and life changers to create a scenario on the inside of you where you understand who you are in the new man, that the old is dead, the new is here, you are a new creation in Christ, all the old things have passed away, everything's become new, you're a brand new person, you're, the <clears throat> you're a person who's never seen in the earth before Jesus. Everyone in the Old Testament could only have a visitation with God. He could come on them, he could lift off them. But in the new covenant, we are now a habitation of God. We're a dwelling place of God by the Spirit. God lives in us. You're a whole new creation, never seen in the earth before Jesus. So now all prophecy gravitates towards the new man, not the old one. It'll be your old nature that stops prophecy being fulfilled. It'll be your new man <clears throat> that causes you to receive and respond. In the new covenant, we tie the prophetic word to the new man in Christ, not the old one that's already dead. The reason God killed your old man is because nobody in heaven wanted the job of changing it. When you were raised from the dead in Christ, your old man stayed in the grave. can't understand churches that are constantly resurrecting the old nature and getting people to repent over it. It's like exhuming a corpse and giving it plastic surgery. It's the dumbest thing ever. Not to believe in the new man in Christ is a nonsense. Maybe it's one of those doctrines of devils. Who knows? This is what I do know, though. I know that there are plenty of ministries going to the wall right now who have prophetic words over their life, but they never learned how to live in them. And they can't afford to be in ministry anymore, and they're getting jobs because they never realize that prophecy is currency. They were asking God to bless their ministry and he's looking at them saying, but I only bless identity because that's more important. Your identity is your ministry. But their identity hadn't grown to fit the word that they'd received. There's a window of opportunity facing a glow and it's the opportunity of a lifetime. This next 50 years will be marked by a new dynamic alignment from the leadership throughout this movement. Jane has been leading this response for years, always referencing the word. I know I've said that three times. But you need to understand her passion for the prophetic. And it needs to run through all of us. We need to pay attention to the words specific to a glow. And we all must step into line with our prophetic destiny as individuals, as regionals, as area teams, as lighthouses, and at headquarters. You're always.
always tested by your passion for the calling, the fight, and the mission. We're being tested by the prophecies we have. And the test is, can a glow come into alignment and agreement? In Genesis 37, Joseph has this prophetic dream <coughs> that he would be ruling over his brothers and they would be bowing down to him. In Psalm 105, you should read it, 16 to 24, describes the process he went through to see that word fulfilled. And the key verse there, I think, is verse 19. And he says, Until the time that his word came to pass, the word of the Lord tested him. We're being tested by the prophecies that God has given us. Do we really believe them? We've got words about resources. We've got words about wealth. We're being tested by those words. What is our response to the Lord? Our response to the Lord cannot be to pray. Because when you get a prophetic word, it's the end of prayer. It's the beginning of proclamation. You intercede until you get a prophetic word. Then when you've got one, then you change your language and your focus. I don't pray about any of my prophecies. I proclaim them. I read them out. I don't proclaim about any of the key scriptures that God has given me. Sometimes the Lord comes and says, great, read Psalm 91. And I have to read it out loud because he apparently he likes my accent. <laughs> so I read it out and I can hear him like going, oh yeah, I love that part. Oh yeah. Hey, you're in that right now, eh? That's cool. Oh, you got this to come. And when I finish, he says, go on then. And I do my little thing, Lord, you said, Lord, you said, Lord, you said, Lord, you said. And I can picture him standing there with his, with his hands open, big smile on his face and going, I did. I totally did. I really did. I'm so glad I did. Oh, yeah, I definitely said that. I definitely said, I really meant that. I would love to see that. I can see him responding to me when I read his prophetic word back to him. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I get that. I totally meant that. And then suddenly, in those interactions, apart from just the pressure of his passion, and his warmth, and his beauty, and his love for me, which I'm basking in, there is that sense of certainty. Oh, yeah. And then there's a new energy. And then quite often you'll say, okay, now, make some coffee and let's talk about it. And that's when I usually think strategically. What do I need to do next? What event do I need to do next? What teaching do I need to release next? All the prophetic teaching on my site, it's all come out of my own life and my own relationship with the Lord and my own promises. So anything in those words that strikes you, you can totally have it. It's totally yours. I hope you take me for everything you can get. Joseph's word was fulfilled in Genesis chapter 42. Every leader in a glow is being tested by the prophetic words that we've already got and we're all going to be tested by the words from this weekend. Yahoo. Yahoo. The test is designed to elevate you. It's designed to upgrade you. It's designed to prepare you. God isn't looking and saying, who's going to believe this or not? Let's give him a test. Test is not about that. The test is, how fast can you rise up and occupy the space that God has set aside for you when he released that word? I 
do believe this. Grasshoppers cannot inherit. And leaders who are not in alignment with destiny, who just want business as usual, will not stand the heat of accelerated development. Because when you say yes to a word, then God says yes to you in terms of uh, giving you a quickening spirit so you can catch up, giving you an accelerated development so you can learn faster, and putting you in a place where you can begin to proclaim to the Lord, this is who you are for me, this is who I am, this is what I have. And I love the fact that I like bringing prophetic words to prayer meetings because then it turns into a proclamation meeting because you don't need to pray about your prophecies. You need to proclaim their reality. I like proclamation meetings. I think we should have more of them. Make no mistake though, beloved. The test is designed to make us into the people who can bear the weight of fulfillment. Joseph was arrogant and prideful when he received that prophetic dream. He was humble, wise, and responsible when it was fulfilled. He could bear the power and the prestige of that rule. You know, the stakes we're playing for, they're huge. They're global. They're powerful. And we must develop leaders and key people who can live on a high place in the kingdom. We have to pass the test of agreement, alignment, and corporate change. Study those words. What belongs to us? What are we called to do? What is the current discrepancy in identity between present and future? Reframe the elements of change necessary for us to match the word that God has given us. Upgrade your lens and your mindset and your language. It's being upgraded constantly. (coughs) Pray and position yourself according to promise, not circumstances. Step into the flow of release and move out into deeper places. A globe began by people who were pioneers creating new territory. And many of us in a globe have become settlers on the territories that we've won. A settler is not programmed to take territory that still needs claiming. We need more explorers and pioneers, warriors and champions and game changers being raised up in our midst. Who wants to explore? Who wants to pioneer? Who wants to become a warrior? Who wants to be a champion? Who wants to be a game changer? Pick at least one of those. If you're English or from Texas, you'll be picking three or four. (laughs) Regions and areas must follow Jane's lead and keep prophecy alive. Make decisions in line with a future that's already been decided. In regions and lighthouses, we must upgrade our focus. You can always tell people who won't see prophecy fulfilled. They're the ones who are still fearful, who are always backing down in situations, crying out for rescue instead of striking the ground. first thing that Jane said to us in our IBOD meeting on Tuesday was, we're living in a culminating moment. We're living in a culminating moment. What's that? Lots of things are coming together in one place. 
and, it's, and the seas are boiling all around us right now. Unprecedented opportunity to overcome and create a new momentum. There's a window of opportunity. For Israel in the wilderness, it was the opportunity to stop being a rabble of slaves and become a disciplined army that could take territory. For a glow, this is where we stop being a parachurch organization and become an apostolic prophetic movement that sweeps all before them. At stake here, listen to me now, at stake here, at risk here, is a glow's future and our destiny in the earth. You should have, then you would have. We don't want to hear those words. We are handpicked by God to prepare the world for the return of the King. We're a people of intercession who have now become the architects of proclamation. We decree in line with a higher authority and in alignment with our prophetic destiny as a matter of course because it wouldn't occur to us in these coming days to do anything different or to do anything less. Pay attention to what happened these last few meetings to Barbara, to Chuck, to Dutch and what they released, awesome, incredible. Pay attention, Aglow. Your mandates just got a serious upgrade. Pay attention to your mantle from God as a company of people. This is a new upgraded Pentecost for the end times. Coming to a people who are mature in the spirit, who can become leaders of a whole new move. Glow is rising up in the power of the new man. Living in the reality of being life changers and game changers. Only Christ in you can accomplish this. There's a new generation of a glow rising. I love seeing all those young people coming out and talking to us. Oh my God. There are some really tasty people in that group, eh? We are a mix of older generation of Joshua's and Caleb's guiding and building a younger generation who will inherit the absolute fullness of what God has released. Young people who can reach into the future and bring it into the present. I love the guy at the end who said, I'm 25. When I'm 75, I want to be celebrating 100 years of a glow. Sheesh. You want to throw your mantle around people like that. People in alignment will surpass those who are out of focus. I want to say this too. The glass ceiling in the church just got smashed. The glass ceiling in the church just got smashed to pieces. And that demands a lens change, a mindset shift, a new language. The old wineskin of a glow is inflexible. Great wisdom from yesterday, but must give way to an expectation fueled by dreams and vision and prophecies that will change the planet. If we can't respond to this, it means we're going to become an out-of-date people saying out-of-date things. Pretty much like half of the evangelical church right now. An out-of-date people saying out-of-date things. Not understanding that destiny is always 
progressing. I think this is the biggest, most key moment in the glow history. And so it's important for us to bring all our prophetic words from the background to the foreground and begin looking at the keys that God is giving us. I've always felt that Jane is like, my title for Jane would be keeper of the keys. <laughs> On Saturday morning before the meeting, God gave me a picture of, uh, picture of you, Jane. And it was um, you dressed um, like a queen with a crown on your head and with one of these things in your... My God, this is heavy. Hope you've been working out. <laughs> He's heavy. <clears throat> and I saw a picture of I saw a picture of Jane standing in front of a huge door and she took the this end of it and she banged on the door and it swung open and she expected it to swing open and when she crossed the threshold, there's all kinds of boxes, um, cases, uh, crates, full of gifts. Yes. And a voice said, they're all yours, open them. And when you began to open them, there were words from the 1960s, others words from the 70s, others key words. They were all prophetic words and promises. And you began to discover each of them and you realized some of them were in treasure chests because they were so important. And these are all the words and dreams and visions that have been in your heart and in this ministry for years. Because you're the keeper of prophetic keys. That's who you are to God. And that's why he trusts you so much because you're unwilling to let his word fall to the ground. And the Lord is saying, I have granted you all these blessings and resources and now it's time for you to take me for granted. Now this is the end and it's like this formal thing like Jane, the end of intercession about the future has come and a new day of proclamation about the future is before us. Now where we would have written crafted prayers, now we, written, now we write crafted proclamations and we proclaim them. Every time a situation crops up, we don't pray about it, we proclaim over it. We, we speak to it in the name of Jesus and we bring the, the, that sense of the alive word into that situation. And the time, the Lord is saying, the time is now. The day is here. No more waiting for timing to be fulfilled. It is time. No more waiting for time to be fulfilled. It is time. Take God for granted. Step into all that he's spoken. Expect resources to come, but expect resources to follow your proclamation. Properties, finance, people will flow towards you. Your hunger for God's presence, this is a deeply personal thing, something you've been crying out for for a long time, that you want to come into a whole new place of relationship with God personally. And the Lord says, I grant you that. I grant you encounters. You've had dreams about encounters. And the Lord says, every one of those dreams, and knowing you, you can remember every one of them. Every one of those dreams will happen just as you saw it just as you saw it. But your hunger for encounter with God is matched by his desire for encounter with you. So this is a whole new day. 
in your relationship with the Lord. And your hunger for God's presence will open up new and magnificent encounters with Him. That's why the scepter is so important. God's giving you a seal of something in the kingdom. And Jane, you'll go from strength to strength in your physical body, in your spirit, in your mind, your eyes, your lens, your language, the way you speak. You'll go from strength to strength. And the Lord says, places that were closed will open. And restoration will occur all around your life and ministry. And I see hundreds of thousands of new people, young people, rising up as key leaders and ministries. And the Lord has said, there is one prayer I would like you to keep praying. Lord, give me this day my whatever you want to ask for. Give me this day. Give it to me now. Give it to me now. Lord, give me this day. Give me this day. Because that's the day we're in. This is the time that we're in. You want to take that back? It's like weightlifting. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Here's the thing. Here's the thing. This destiny cannot fall on Jane's shoulders alone. The test is for all our current leadership. throughout the globe, throughout the earth, for all of us to rise up, one heart, one mind, one spirit, one voice. This requires an unprecedented step up into a dynamic place of leadership and fellowship. We've been handed a golden ticket. There's a quickening spirit that comes with it. There's accelerated development that comes with it. There's a divine advantage that comes with it. Business as usual just got killed. <laughs> Business as usual just got run over by a truck full of promises. And it did not survive the prophetic encounter. This newer glow has been coming for the last three to five years. We all need to get on board because now it's here and we all need to adjust to a new reality. No more grasshopper lighthouses. No more areas out of alignment. No more doing what's right in your own eyes. No more undeveloped regions. No more lack of resources. No more dependency on headquarter funding. No more waiting. No more excuses. The king is here. Turn your face towards him and become radiant. Speak back the words that he gave to us in prophecy. Look to God as the author and finisher. You all have these prophetic promises. So you have to develop your own line of credit with God. This is a great day for us. God intends for us to overwhelming and conquer. This prophetic word here is I want to give you the capacity to wage complete destruction on the enemy. Whatever country you come from, to push him back so hard, he will not come back against you. When you live in the, king, when you live in the kingdom, your country that you live in can be upgraded to that level. We are facing the opportunity of a lifetime. And beloved, 
we must act within the lifetime of the opportunity. Don't be waiting a few months to see how it pans out. You can be asking the Lord today, today, what do I need to do? Some of you, the Holy Spirit is already talking to you about it, where you're sitting. The next thing he wants to overwhelm, the next thing he wants to grow in you. These are unprecedented days. This is an unprecedented event. We had unprecedented ministry from Barbara and Chuck and Dutch. And they released something together that is astonishingly powerful, unprecedented. And it requires an unprecedented response. And it's designed to create an unprecedented people. And that's who we are. Let's pray. Father, I thank you. These are the days of astonishing promise. Heaven is open to us. Not a window in heaven, but a huge door. And the first thing you're connecting us with is our prophetic destiny. And so Father, right where we are, we wanna stand in your presence and say, Jesus, I'm with you. I'm all in. I'm all in. And we need to be acting in response to the word. So I don't know why people are still sitting down. First lesson, beloved, now means now. Now means now. Lord, I'm in. And so, Father, we strike the ground with our response. Lord, you said. 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 Lord, you said, 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 Lord, you said. And our response to the word is, Lord, we believe. We believe. We believe, Lord. <clears throat> we believe it shall be even as it was said. We believe it shall be even as you said, even as you determined. We believe that this is the first day in a brand new era. And we have crossed a line, we have crossed a threshold, we've crossed a Jordan. Now we're taking territory. And now we're going to fight, waging war with prophetic swords. And the sound of Lord you said will be heard all through the nations. A glow people coming together in chaos, in times of trouble and difficulty, times of, times of famine and poverty, and saying, Lord you said, Lord you said. And we'll see miracles. We'll see water coming out of a rock or the equivalent thereof. We'll see food being delivered. First food delivery service in the history of the world, in the desert with Israel. We'll see extraordinary miracles because all of heaven is attracted to Jesus in us. May it be so, Lord.
because Jesus deserves it. He deserves a people like this. So we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for listening. I appreciate it. When Graham referenced a, a conversation a month or so ago and said my response was, hmm. <laughs> That's not an unbelieving or questioning, hmm. Do you ever just feel so overcome with the Lord? Yes. You have no words. Jesus. Yeah. This is a hmm moment. <laughs> Last night when Tony and I went back to the room, and I won't keep you standing long, we'll draw this to a close, but we just sat on the bed and prayed and talked and prayed and entered into all that God was doing and saying. And yet, you know, you can, it's so big, you can't even really comprehend it. Yes. But you can say yes. yes. And you can step in. Yes. You begin the journey. Yes. Amen. And this day, this conference, we have begun a new journey yes. into a new future. Yes. And I want to use the end of this uh, scepter. scepter. scepter yeah. <laughs> I'm not used to carrying around a scepter. <laughs> Woo. <that> okay. <laughs> but I'm going to use the end of this today to prophetically break. Yes. Break. 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 Any barrier break. over your life personally. Yes. Over yes. your lives as leaders, yes. over this Ooh. ministry, words of death yes. that have been spoken, we step into the life that yes. has been pronounced over us this weekend, yes. a future word. Amen. We're not living in the past, no. but we're moving from the present into future. our future. Yes. Ooh. So step Amen. into it today and we speak it over the whole of the glow those far and wide it will be felt every eye will see everyone will come into the understanding as we go forth as new people i had thought of the the bent over woman before coming to this conference she could in no way raise herself up there was nothing she could do for herself. But Jesus took note of her, and he beckoned her to him, and he began to speak words of life over her that lifted her up, caused her to arise and walk forward straight. Amen. That is what has happened in the life of a glow, yes. in the lives of women all over the world, and yes, Amen. men as well. Amen. And this conference has caused us to straighten further and to arise higher. Amen. And when Graham referenced today, and I think yes. I, I even spoke it myself in one of our gatherings, yes. Yes. there is a hunger in me. I've walked with God for years. Yes. I hunger after him. I hunger after his word. But there is a fresh and a deeper hunger in me. Yes. And it is, it is said that you can't lead people higher than you've been yourself. I'm telling you, get ready for a ride because Ooh. this... <laughs> is going after God Amen. for all that he has, for all that he is. Yes. We're going.
going higher and deeper than we've ever gone before. I thank you for the word you've spoken over the Aglow ministry today. Yes, yes. And the words that you've, the life that you've poured into us. Yes. First time he was with us, 2004, and he has walked with us Amen. all of these years. He Amen. has poured his strength, his life, his, he's Amen. poured God into us. Yes. Please acknowledge. Jenna, he's tied to us. Yes, hallelujah. 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 I just stand here thinking of, I just feel like, wow, I struck it rich. I have Dan <laughs> Hammer as my pastor. I have Graham as my friend, Barbara as my friend. Yeah. <laughs> I count Chuck and Dutch as friends. Don't talk with them very often, but yeah. think of what God has added to our ministry. Yes. Because his hand is upon us. Yeah. And I believe his hand is upon us because of your faithfulness, yes. your continued prayers, Amen. your standing together and hungering with me for all God has for yes. us. Amen? Yes. Amen. Amen. Here's the closing scripture. And I don't know if you have a song, but here's our closing scripture. Now unto him who is able to keep you from stumbling or losing your way or being in confusion or living in the past or yes. no, he is able to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Yes. To God our Savior, yes. who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forevermore. Woo.